Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. Today in Dave's Garage, we're going to look at Arduino displays using both OLED and LCD technology. We're going to learn how they're connected, learn how to program them, test and code one ourselves old school style so that you see the entire process from start to finish with no mystery gaps. And by the time we're done, you'll know so much about OLEDs and LCDs that your spouse won't even recognize you anymore. So if you don't mind a little software and electronics, strap on in because we're starting right now. My goal at the workbench today is to get you equipped with all the knowledge you need to program an OLED or LCD display for the Arduino framework. Be it SPI or I2C, doesn't matter. Bring it on. We'll code it today. As long as your chip supports the display you're dealing with, then all the code we're dealing with today will compile and work for you on any of the chips in the Arduino framework. Nothing of what we're doing today is in any way specific to the ESP32 or to any chip for that matter. Now, you've probably already got a reason for wanting to add a display to your project, or you wouldn't be watching this video. But if you just happen to be watching this video and considering should I add a display, the answer is yes, even if your final project doesn't need one. I'm going to recommend that you have one for the development process, debugging as well as just raw development, because they're just that handy. My own fascination with monitoring and watching what's going on inside the machine probably goes back to the MS-DOS days and watching Norton Speed Disk move blocks around my hard disk. That would keep me entertained for a surprisingly long time. So it's perhaps no wonder that I'm the guy that wound up writing Task Manager for Windows because I wanted to monitor what was going on inside of there as well. I wanted to know who was using my CPU, who had all my RAM, how many window handles were there, all kinds of stats and information. There's just a ton of information available to the developer through various APIs, but there was no tool to bring them all together and show you and give you command and control of the system in one place. So that's why I wrote that. If you use Task Manager well, you can really get a feel for the pulse of the system and what's going on inside. Similarly, we can use our display to render pertinent stats about what's going on with our application and with the chip in general at any point in time. If it's information that changes more slowly, like room temperature, things like that, that I'm usually content to log out to the serial port like people have been doing since probably the 1950s and 60s. I'm sure serial port debugging will be with us for a long time. But being able to get instantaneous and contemporaneous information what am I, hanging around with the attorneys now? Being able to find out what's going on right now is actually very important. And that kind of information would just be cluttering up your logs if you just printed everything that happened all the time. The amount of work and skill involved in getting JTAG debugging set up on a microcontroller so you can watch a variable in the IDE, it's impressive stuff. It's way easier to print F out to a screen and say, hey, look, there's 32 blocks left in the cache or whatever your stat is. And all of this is even more true if you're using Wi-Fi, like on the ESP32. Particularly if you've got a chip that's sitting out somewhere in an application and it's not connected to a serial port, and maybe you want to remote debug it by Telnet. Well, how do you find the TCP IP address? It's got it from DHCP and you don't have access to their router. Now what do you do? What do you do? You print it to the screen on 192.168.0. whatever, and then you don't worry about it. Oh, I guess I just told you my subnet. Oh, I guess you can start to hack me. When selecting a display, there are really three decisions you're going to have to make. Display technology, display size, and display interface. So that is, how's the thing made, how big is it, and how does it connect to your chip? In terms of the display technology, pretty much everything has been available at some point in time. LCD, LED, OLED, VFD, is that a thing? Vacuum fluorescent. Oh yeah, TFT, it's all out there. Some of it has a fairly standard API, some of it's very different. There's about 12 different controller chips and there are multiple interfaces. There's just a huge range of permutations and combinations of things that you need to account for when hooking up a display. So it would sure be nice, and yeah, somebody's already done it, if somebody wrote a library called UAG2 that just took care of all of this nonsense for you. And fortunately, somebody has done a good job of it. So at the top level, we need to know what our display does and what interface it is, but not how that interface works. So right now, you need to know that if your display is I2C, it's got a clock line, a data line, and a reset line. And that's it. I mean, other than power and ground, of course. But those are the three lines that you need to connect. And we won't worry ourselves today too much with what goes on those lines, because we can treat it as a black box once it's connected. We'll get more information later, and we'll hook up all kinds of devices. You can have up to 128 connected. So way back in 1982, the year I started high school and the year Eddie Grant released Electric Avenue, the spec for I2C communications came out from Philips. And it was a way for them to integrate and put a whole bunch of chips on one board, like a VCR or a television or whatever that Philips was building in those days, and to have them all communicate using only these three little wires. We'll take a deeper dive on both I2C and SPI in future episodes, but right now, all you really need to know is that I2C communicates with all the chips that are connected to your processor 
via three wires, clock, data, and ground. It passes the ID and who wants to talk to who all in the data path. So you don't have to worry about any of that. Three wires, and since we're using this Heltec chip where it's already mounted and installed and pre-wired, we don't even have to do that yet. So let's get down to some basic coding with the library. So the library you want and the library everybody uses is called U8G2, a universal 8-bit graphics library version 2. But how do I know that? What am I, Kreskin? I just woke up one day and I just magically knew what to do? Of course not. I went to a website and I used a search engine and I typed in my what need and I got a library back. So let's do that process so you can find your own libs in the future. Just point your browser at platformio.org, which is where you got the IDE from the first place, probably. Once you get there, click on libraries. And I know it sounds like I'm saying library, but I know there's two R's in there. I'm just from a region where that first R is a little soft, so humor me, would you? We type OLED in, we press enter, and the top result is UHG2, and it has 36,000 downloads, and it supports our chip. That's all you need to know. There are other options that perhaps give you more functionality on a particular chipset. So because the Heltec unit uses the 1306, we see there is an Adafruit 1306 library. It's possible it does things that the generic library doesn't, but unless your needs are really complex, let's just stick with the regular one first. And we can do much the same thing within PlatformIO itself. Go to your Libraries tab, which you can find on the left here, and we'll do the same search. OLED. UHG2. Now, I could just click Install. Do it. Do it. Install to. Global Storage, which means for all projects. Just this project, and then I've got the name of some of my projects. I'm not going to do any of this. I'm sure it works fine. But I get the willies when I start using IDEs to link in my libraries and then I'm going to move this code somewhere and it's going to work again. It never does. So I want to do the most notepad -y solution I can, which is to say I want to know what to type and where to type it. Unfortunately, it's like two lines of code is what's going to happen here. Create yourself a new C project using Platform.io by clicking File New and doing New Project. I'll run through the wizard myself now so you can see how to set it up for the Heltec board if you have the Heltec board handy. We'll call it... Heltech First Light, and if we search, Heltech Wi-Fi Kit 32. The exact match. I love it. I love it when a plan comes together. Mwah. This platformio.any file really describes everything about your project. It's like the huge thing that VS Studio would puke out, but a small, sensible, reasonable version. That's pretty much the only other file that you get out of the wizard, so let's take a look in there. This is where you put everything about your project, so if the serial port for your project was weird and custom, you would have to put that here. Extra flags to pass to the linker, that goes here. Everything really goes here that's relevant to your project, not least of which are library dependencies. And to add one, we put it in the libdep section. That's it. That's all you need. It will download it, it will do all the magic, and it will keep it fresh and up to date with the current version. You can also use the grammar, there's an at symbol followed by a version number, where you can say, no, I only want version 2.82 forever because I don't trust the developers of this library to not break my code, so I want to lock in on an old version. You can do that as well. And of course, you can regress to an older version if something breaks. So you can always just leave it as the current version, and if you find yourself confronted with a problem of library incompatibility, you can go back to an older version at that point. That's generally what I recommend. Well, if there's a library, there's probably a header file. So that's all we need to do. Add the single header file. And in Telesense, I already beat us to it. That's it. To make sure I can communicate with the board, I'm going to do a quick flash to it. And I'm going to just blink the LED that's on board. It has two LEDs. One is for the LiPo charger. The other is a status LED, which is white. And so we're going to blink the white one. It's worth noting that even though this board comes with a built-in LED, you've still got to tell the ESP32 that that's how you plan to use that pin. Because you could be using it for input. Perhaps the ground sink for the LED being tied to it doesn't affect you, and so you can still use that chip pin. They don't interfere with it. There's nothing about the chip's configuration on the board that predestines it to only control the LED. So upload. I like to fill these long build intermissions with some little messages to remind you to subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Did it work? Did he subscribe?
Perfect. And indeed, the LED is blinking. I'm going to wander over and see how it looks for you on the task on the chip cam. On the chip cam, it's not really blinking crisply. It's more of a wah, wah, wah. Put your ear to it. It actually makes that sound, honest. The reason for that is I have to fake long persistence on this video camera to not get a bunch of refresh rate interference between the video camera and the OLED display. So 90% of the magic in using the UAG2 library is just figuring out what the heck constructor to use. Generally, the constructor is going to be an amalgamation of UAG2 followed by your chip name and the brand name and the size of the display and the interface style, whether it's SPI or I2C, and information about it. And they pack all that into a long word and you search for it in the header file and you hope you find yours. Let's look at that header file now. Well, this doesn't look too bad, except, oh, look at this monster. These are all constructors. And it goes on and on and on and on and on and on for a long ways. Yeah, 16,380 some lines of constructor. That's a lot of constructors. If you can't find yours, you're not looking hard. Or you've got a new chip. Maybe that's the problem. Wait, what's that, Carl? What well, if my display is newer than the header file? How do I find it? Uh, then you've got to figure it out based on maybe searching through this file for your chipset, searching through for your brand name, searching through for your size, until you find something that's really close. In my case, the closest I can find is a no-name chip with every other aspect matching. By far, probably the best, easiest, and most productive way to do this, however, is to go to Google, search for your model number of whatever display you're dealing with, followed by a space, and then UAG2. Somebody else will have probably done it before you, and you'll find the information. That's what I did, and here's what I got. Once more, with feeling. So mercifully, this gets you about 95% of the way there. A single declaration of one global variable. That's all you need. Now, one thing I will caution you on is the constructors don't always put the arguments in the same order. Clock and data are sometimes reversed. Why would they swap the clock and data lines from one constructor to the next? It's, it's madness. I'm sure it's burned a lot of people. So I'm going to pound to find these so that I don't forget that they have very specific meanings. They're not just three pins. In our constructor, it is clock, data, reset. All right, I feel a little better about that. Let's put in the initialization code to get the library up and running. This should be all that's required to print to the display. Let's take a look at what these functions do so we don't duplicate a bunch of functionality. So begin calls on it clear. We don't need to call clear or init. I'll bet you clear maybe does the same thing. It also calls home and clear buffer. Then it sets font, print. Well, let's see what we get. I'm compiling this on my Mac from the olden times, which is to say 2013. And I pledge to spend every penny this channel earns exclusively on new Mac hardware until I am so satisfied that I refuse to complain anymore. That's where I stand. Well, we get a big fat nothing. Blank screen. But the LED is still blinking, so we didn't crash it. In other words, we did something, but it had no effect. It's because we made two mistakes. I made one. The other is a questionable design decision to me. I'll fix them both now. Once you've done all your transmission or interaction with the OLED, you need to call send buffer. But we still would have gotten nothing. And the reason is because when we call the clear function above, it calls home. Home places the cursor at zero, zero. All text drawing starts from the bottom up. So, in my mind, they should really, when they call home, set the Y position to be the bottom of the first character. But they don't. So you see nothing. So let's set that ourselves. I'm going to create another global variable to go along with the OLED itself, which is its line height. I'm going to ask the controller for the line height. We need to do this after calling set font. Better get a code review.
it works. We got our hello world. It looks a little far down for my taste, so I'm not quite sure what's up. <laughs> I hope you saw that. That's pretty embarrassing. As you can see, I did font ascent plus font ascent. Welcome to being burned, not burned. Self-immolation on IntelliSense. I meant get font descent. And it's going to be a negative number. So I'm going to subtract it, actually. And add a comment. I'm going to introduce the use of printf here, which may surprise you, but because the display class implements the print interface, it's able to handle printf. And so it's actually quite handy in that regard. You don't have to print to a buffer first and then print the buffer to the display and that sort of thing. Perfect. So I'm not sure how I feel about that. Um, committing bugs live and so on and so forth. Obviously, the other option is for me to have the text pre-prepared in an editor off screen that I then copy and paste from. But then you'd be watching some dude copy and paste, and what kind of fun is that? Don't you want to see the live bugs and like get to spot them before I do? Well, hopefully I don't do a lot of that, but you never know. So let me know in the comments if you want live or you want super accurate. I can go either way. Well, Carl tells me we're running a little long, so rather than do a Sopranos ending on you, I'm going to push the graphics and the fancy optimization and that kind of stuff off to the next episode. Gives you something to come back for, and it gives me something to prepare for. Maybe I'll have fewer bugs next time. I'll see you on the other side. Well, while I'd hoped to cover everything in one segment, and we did the basics of controlling a display for text purposes, there's a lot more that we'll have to wait until next time. Make sure that's what's coming up next in your queue. I hope you found today's episode some combination of interesting and informative. If you did, I encourage you to let me know by liking and subscribing, and most importantly, turning on the bell notification so you find out when the next episode comes out. Otherwise, this is such a small channel that you'll likely never stumble across it again. Please do pause and subscribe now if you haven't already. And now that you know a little bit about these displays, don't just stop there. Join me next time as we conclude our OLED and LCD introduction with graphics and performance issues. We'll count frames per second as we draw lines, shapes, and fonts, and then we'll make it a lot faster. I hope to see you then, so as always, thanks, and good night. Well, hello everybody. My name is Carl. C-A-R-L, Carl. I'm the cameraman. Good night everybody. Don't forget to subscribe.